Well, thank you all for joining us today. We're um, excited to see you all. I see a lot of familiar faces and a few new ones, which is nice too. For anyone who doesn't know me, I'm Jennifer Limmer Posey. I'm the Tibbles Curator of Circus, and uh, nothing makes me happier than talking about our circus collections. And talking about them with dear colleagues is even better. So David, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, I'm David Berry. I'm the Associate Director for Academic Affairs and Special Projects. And uh, Jennifer and I have been collaborating on a number of those special projects over the last couple of years. And uh, it's been a great pleasure. And it's been through that process that I've come to know more about the subject that we're going to explore today. So it's a fun one and we hope you enjoy. So the circus collections are extraordinarily diverse. Uh, we are so fortunate to have a wealth of materials to tell the various stories of circus and allied arts. And we have for many years focused a lot on, on the collections that are shown in the galleries that are featured. Uh, and we are now delving deeper into some of the original collections and some collections that seemed like they were kind of on the sidelines of circus history, but with the research we're doing, we're starting to realize how much they can help us understand more of the, the context of the circus and allied arts and culture. And these early circus prints are, are really an exciting part of that to me. In doing research about re the reinstallation of the historic circus galleries, I was reading a lot about Chick Austin, who founded the museum as, interestingly enough, the, the Museum of the American Circus. And then the first thing he did was go out and buy a bunch of European prints, um, which I, I think is, uh, it, it says a lot about circus in general, that it's always a bit of a push and pull about what kind of stories we want to tell and what are interesting. But I, I think that Chick Austin was very much onto something with these selections of early European prints. One, they are this first point to marry the circus collection with the ideals of the art museum. And more than that, they show us that circus arts don't just start at one point in time. So Dave and I are gonna talk about that from our various points of view today uh, going forward. And we look forward to engaging with you in the conversation if you have any questions along the way. So can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, we thought we would start out with what circus really is in most people's popular imagination these days. And it is this tented city, this wondrous moving village of people that set up a city there in, a, in an empty lot and transformed the landscape of American towns and then was gone the next day. Uh, that is the story that we tell the best, I think, at The Ringling because our collections have allowed that. The Howard Brothers circus model brings that to life in three dimensions. And the, the photographic collection gives us that sense of reality. And that kind of circus lot is, is made up of many different things. We see it in this particular photograph that you have the, the midway experience as people come in, there are concessions to be bought. The sideshow banner line is here at the front. So you can imagine the curiosities you can see if you choose to buy a ticket to that attraction. And then if you bought your ticket and are headed in, you're going to go under the marquee tent and enter into the menagerie so that you get to see all of these wonderful exotic animals. And that was an important asset to the circus early on because it meant that it was bringing people in for educational purposes. Once you've walked through that, you finally get into the experience that we think of now as, as circus, the, in this case, the three ring performance space of the Ringling Brothers Circus, and this is 1923 in Cleveland. I think it's an amazing photo, but it, it gives a sense of all that we expect out of the circus experience and, and all that Americans in particular imagine circus to be. And what we're finding through the print collection is that you, all of these different elements had their own lives until they came into a great confluence in the circus lot. In America, that happened really in the early to mid 19th century. In Europe, it's a little bit harder to track because these elements had had such disparate lives for a long time and they came together in various ways that I think we'll be able to explore as we go through the presentation. Um, anything to add to the opening, David? No, that was perfect. <laughs> oh, good. Well, then we're off to a great start. So I take the interest in looking at where the circus arts, the performance portions of what we think of as the circus really got their start. And 
we know that circus arts date back really into early uh, ceremonies and rituals. You see performance as a sort in, in all phases of culture. With the early print collection, we can start to see when these moments were so important that they registered in a, in a more broad, popular way. So I've pulled this up. This image is an extraordinary print that dates from the mid 16th century. I will admit that the actual image on the screen is not the one in our collection. The photograph of our piece was skewed and was not, I, I couldn't get the full image, but it's marvelous that I had to borrow this one from UCLA Humanities Division because they, someone in this has been so fascinated by the image that they've drawn a little circle down at the bottom right. And what they've circled there is the beginning of that tight wire. So this event, the Flight of the Turk, was part of the carnival season. And in the 16th century, Ottoman Turks would come into Venice to perform during this time period. It was, it was part of the exchange route between cultures, between the Italians and the Ottomans. And having these people from foreign lands come and entertain the crowds was, was part of the ruling class's way of showing the diversity of cultures that were being brought into the city. So the Venetians were mesmerized by this, this acrobat who was able to walk from a floating barge, uh, a wire that was strung or a rope, strung from a rope floating barge all the way to the top of the bell tower on St. Mark's. So it crossed the piazza and it was this marvelous spectacle that marked the beginning of the carnival season and was repeated for decades afterwards there in Venice. Um, and if we go to the next slide, as carnival evolved in Venice, there was a period of time that it was, that the, that the celebrations were limited. So starting at around the 17th century, they limited the number, the, the size of the festivals. And in the 20th century, it was revived. And one of the first elements that was brought back was this flight of the Turk, except we, they no longer had the acrobats to do that walk from the floating barge up to the tower. And so now it's actually a, more like sliding down a wire. They go from the top of the bell tower down across the piazza. And it is a, a human figure, a person performing up top. They dance as they go across and they sprinkle the crowds with confetti. Uh, so we see how this one moment of, of cross-cultural experience became so richly combined that it became an important element to the festival there in Venice. And that dates from the 16th century and continues on today. So that's one of the earliest examples we have of the circus arts being performed and being such an important part of the cultural experience of a city. Uh, and I think that's the kind of pieces that I'm hoping we can tease more and more out of our collection as we go along. If we can go to the next slide. When I began this position, I was cataloging pieces in Howard Tibble's personal collection of circus materials. And he had in one of his files, along with costume design drawings from the 20th century American circus, these amazing prints, which I now understand as being part of a festival book. It was a printed material that was created to, to memorialize an event. In this case, it was the procession at Carnival time again in Dresden, which was organized by Frederick Augustus, who was elector of Saxony at the time. Uh, what's interesting is in this period of time, it, he's tying this again, obviously, as Carnival part of the religious experience before the Lenten season. And Frederick Augustus was a Protestant, but he was very interested in assuming the role of king of Poland under the Holy Roman Emperor. So at just this period of time, he had converted. So I think that part of staging these kinds of processions was a way of him implying his own wealth and his own power, and then tying it into that religious order to show to the Holy Roman Emperor that, that he was worthy of these roles. They are extraordinarily extraordinary prints. There are 13 of them in total, and they measure, just for reference, about eight inches in height, and then uh, 24 
18 to 24 inches in length, and all of them show different sections of the parade. There's not a lot of printed material, there's really no printed material with it, so we don't know exactly the different sections, but you can see that they are numbered individually. So there would have been some sense of what these all represented. For me, my first experience of these was contextualized by what they were surrounded with. If we can go to the next slide, David. Uh, which were these amazing drawings from a 20th century artist, Max Weldy, who designed costumes for Ringling Brothers, Barnum and Bailey. And it, as you can see, this, these two drawings are part of his designs for a spec parade, which would have taken place inside the circus Big Top in 1940. The theme of it that year was the return of Marco Polo, which is just coincidental, but I think it's marvelous that even at this point in the 20th century, the circus recognized that these kinds of displays often were attached to a, a sort of political undertone, something to show the greatness of the world, to show what Marco Polo had achieved in, in going forth and exploring and what he was able to bring back to the people. And I think, you know, the, the different units show how much the circus was drawing upon these long traditions of parading spectacles that, that far predated their beginnings. So if we can go to the next slide. So those are some of the early examples of the circus arts as they were played out in some of the prints that we have in the collection. I think as we go forward in this kind of research, we'll find examples that tie over across both our collections at the Ringling and many others. But what our collection does very, very well is to give us the foundations of the spaces of the modern circus as we know it. So some of you who have joined me for other talks may recognize this set of prints because they're among my favorite in the collection because they are the, the moment that the circus becomes or begins to become what we conceive of it now, the performance in the rings. And that starts at Astley's Amphitheater just outside of London. And he first stages classes as part of an equestrian school in 1768 and in that moment he transforms their uh, performance space from a long running track into a circular arena and he very quickly establishes that as a place that he can program all kinds of performance and so by 1777 he has built himself a school space that allows for an audience all the way around the track and you'll see in the arcades all the way around the, the faces of people who are admiring the performance of the equestrian performing bare, on the bareback horse, accompanied by the equestrian director and a clown. So already we've got the elements there in the ring of, of the clown and the equestrian. You don't see a tumbler in this particular image performing. However, when you look off to the far right in the image, you actually see acrobats depicted as part of the signage that was on the, the outside of Astley's. So this print gives us the sense of the, the very first performance space and what Astley had conceived as, as British cavalry, as someone who would have been attending performances of different types, his vision of circus as outdoor theater at that point in time. If we can go to the next slide, this is that same moment in time, you can see the same uh, acrobats stacked up on the side of the building. So this is the exterior of Astley's. And for me, with the interest in posters and the visual advertising of the circus, to find this from the very beginning, that from the moment that we have circus, the advertising in this visual way with big banners, and even it's hard to make out in this particular print, but along the side walls, there are little tiny uh, broadsides and bills that are posted on the side of the building. There's, you know, the evidence of writing along these things to give the list of the acts that would be seen performing in that day. But as we know with circus, simply putting out words about what you're going to see happen is really never enough. So having these images on the banners and having the equestrian there at the top to, to signify that that's the heart of all of these performances was really critical to Astley's undertaking and to bringing audiences in. If we can go to the next slide. So this bill is again one of one of my favorite go-to's because I think that it's really fascinating to see the performance at the top that I believe is Mrs. Astley performing on the bill. 
the whole bill gives a description, a blow by blow actually, of what's going to happen during the performance, that Mrs. Astley will ride atop two horses, that Mr. Astley will bound from the ground to the back of a striding horse, um, and so on and so forth. It's, it's the wonderful rich language and excitement of the circus, but it's that idea that you have to accompany it with an image, something that people will have to see for themselves in order to believe. Another reason that this bill is really special to me is because it, it's part of the Tibble Circus collection. And when it was cataloged, both sides of the bill were photographed, uh, but for some reason, not both sides were fully described in the record for it. So if we can go forward, on the back side of that particular bill, which is mounted on a piece of paper, so this is actually mounted onto that, that backing paper, is a, a pencil drawing. And the pencil drawing actually has written underneath it that it is William Capone's sketch of the interior of Astley's Amphitheater in 1777. So if we can go to the next slide, David, you can see them up close. Capone was the artist who was credited for these, for the drawings, for the image in the prints. And when you look at it, I, there's some obviously some perspectival differences and, and some rearrangement of figures, which I think makes it all the more intriguing that it exists because if someone was just trying to copy that sketch and um, you know to, to claim it as belonging to the artist, I would think they would have been more specific in recreating you know the, the placement of the figures along the way in those smaller elements. So it will take some time and some work to figure out if we really do have a sketch that was taken there in 1777 at Astley's Amphitheater, but I think it's a wonderful story. Um, and if it is indeed something that I can in any way ever prove, I think it again speaks to the fact that circus and circus arts have always grabbed individuals in this special way. That piece is something that really would be lost to history in most cases. It would have disappeared, and yet it's it's arrived here at the Ringling Museum with a whole suite of material related to Astley's. It came in with a collection of prints that we're seeing some of, as well as various bills and broadsides related to the early years of Astley's performance. Um, and that was all purchased in the UK for Howard Tibbles a number of years ago. So there is a good chance that it is an original piece. And like I said, the idea that it's all persisted, that it's all stayed together in that way, I think is rather magical. So if we can go forward. The final set that I wanted to talk a little bit about is some late 17th, early 18th century prints that are in the collection. Uh, and I think this is an area that I am eager to explore with with Sarah Cartwright, our curator of collections, and other colleagues as well, because I think, again, we're seeing artists of, of a time period capturing circus subjects, but they're, they're part of a larger cultural dialogue that's going on as well. Uh, so this particular figure, Mary Andrew, was exactly what you would expect, a, a clown-like figure that would have been found at the various pleasure gardens and fairs of the European countries. Um, in this case, he was a performer at Sadler Wells. And we know that he was captured by an artist, or his image was captured by an artist, Marcellus Laroon, whose drawings of everyday people performing their work on the streets were compiled in a volume called The Cries of London. And so in that book, you see a number of different kinds of figures. Most of them are sellers of goods and they're accompanied by the, the cries, by the words that they would use, come, come buy a roll, come, come buy this. But he managed to include in that volume several different performance figures, which I find interesting because again, they're mixed in with the, the working salespeople, the, the people that we think of moving along the streets and being an everyday fixture within the city. And so this performer, Mary Andrew, appears in this image. And if we go forward one more, um, I think that it's also likely Mary, a Mary Andrew, if not the same Mary Andrew, who is at the bottom of this particular image, also part of the Cries of London. And uh, we see him gesturing up to the female wire dancer who 
is I think in the act of swinging on the wire that in this period, this would date from the early 17th century for the printing of this, performers would use a loose wire, a slack wire like that, almost as a trapeze at times. So they would swing and be able to do somersaults and turn on them as well as stand and balance on them. Uh, so these figures appear within the Cries of London and the performance figures in particular appear in multiple pages in that. And so if we can go to the next one, uh, this image I've saved for the last of the three, although all three would have been part of that same volume of cries. This particular impression, which is part of the museum's collection, I believe actually dates from the original issue of that volume in 1688. It has all of the markings of the engraver of the plates, P. Tempest, who was associated with that volume. And we see here the famous Dutch woman. And she actually, if you do a little bit of research on her, we know her name was Mrs. Saltry. I don't know anything more than that. But from the 1670s through around 1690, there are mentions of her performing at various fairs across England. And here in particular, we know she was part of the performance group at Sadler's Wells. So we have this long history of this figure and we see her being of great interest in the everyday life of London through these cries. If we can go to the next image, um, so I've compiled the, the group of them here. The other two images which I had shown initially are actually reprints from a volume that would have been no later than about 1730. Um, it was issued over and over again for over 40 years, uh, which is again uh, relatively interesting that these figures, these everyday figures of life are so compelling to collectors of print material at that time that these volumes are issued for several decades in a row. And then if we go one more forward, by the 1790s, I, I loved coming across this, the celebrated Mrs. Wilkinson, female wire dancer who we see on the right, is, is a very well-known figure in, in circus history. This print is, is reproduced frequently. Uh, but when you see them both together, it's very clear that the printer actually had access to this original image, um, if not a plate that was used to produce the original image because they've taken that same figure even down to the feet. If you look at the positions of the feet for the two women, the, the Dutch woman on the rope has her feet with these wonderful bows on them. So they've, they've changed the shoes a little bit and in doing so altered slightly Miss Wilkinson's front foot on the wire. But everything else, the hands, the shorts, the ruffles down the front are the same until you get to the face of this woman. And for me, this resonates with the circus posters that we have from the 20th century, where you find these common figures of what a bareback rider should be, these expectations that are set on iconic figures of the circus to look a certain way. Um, it starts even before the circus itself was founded in 1768 with these early performers fitting a certain type of what a wire walker should be. Um, I think that that kind of sums up the performance side of this, am I right, David? Yes. So, so a performance obviously is just one part of what we think of the circus to be. David brings a background and expertise that happily complements the performance side with some of the other curious displays. So I'll let you take it. Okay. As Jennifer mentioned, um, the um, images that I've selected from the Ringlings collection look at exotic animals and look at extraordinary people. Um, we have certainly been looking to this point at extraordinary people, but uh, extraordinary in a different way, and we'll get to that shortly. Um, the first print that I picked is this uh, wonderful uh, illustration of Queen Charlotte's zebra from 1762. This is an illustration from the London Magazine. Um, this is Queen Charlotte, the wife of King George III of Great Britain. Uh, they married in 1761. And the zebra was sent to the queen as a belated wedding gift in 1762. It was actually sent from South Africa on the HMS Terpsichord and was presented to the queen. Um, what I love about this particular image is, is the, uh, the inaccuracy of the, the drawing. Um, what you have is what really looks like a thoroughbred racehorse uh, that has either been painted or 
um, draped with a striped outfit that is in no way accurate. So it's very likely in this case that the illustrator had certainly heard of the animal uh, and may have seen it, but certainly did not draw it from life. Um, but this is, as far as I can tell, the first image of the zebra in print in Britain, uh, and it is copied again and again and again. Um, there were actually two zebras that were sent. Um, they were sent as a pair. They're, this is the female zebra. The male zebra died in transit, so it was only the one that ultimately arrived. And uh, Queen Charlotte had an extraordinary interest in uh, exotic animal, uh, animals and in, in plants. Um, she spent quite a bit of time at what, what was Kew Palace uh, and had connections with the people that ultimately laid the foundations of the Royal Botanic Gardens, Kew, in, in the decades to follow. Um, but exotic animals were very much uh, a reflection of her sort of taste and fashion. Um, and the reason I decided to start with this is that it is a nice illustration of the, the history of uh, the, the giving of exotic animals as diplomatic gifts to the rulers in Europe. Uh, and this goes back well into the Middle Ages. You also had exotic animals that were brought back to, to Europe from pilgrimage and from crusade. Uh, and at this point, what we're talking about really is, is the bounty of empire. You have uh, European nations uh, that had established colonies in uh, Africa, in Asia, and in the Americas. And you have um, exotic animals being brought back and put on display uh, in, in ultimately what become private menageries. Menagerie, the term, meaning basically a place to manage animals in, in French. Uh, so this particular uh, zebra becomes a celebrity in, in Britain. Um, it was the first of its type to be seen uh, in the British Isles, and it was shown uh, at a stable and paddock adjacent to Buckingham House, what today is Buckingham Palace, uh, there had been, since the time of James I, a kind of royal menagerie on the grounds of Saint, what today is St. James's Park. Um, that image, you can see, gets copied. Uh, the the uh, copyright laws were not in the middle of the 18th century what they are today. Um, so it is, is copied and reused quite liberally. Uh, and in this case, it, it illustrates a, um, a, a satirical song uh, inspired by what came to be popularly known as the Queen's Ass. Uh, and the part of this is, is the fact that at the time, uh, zebras were believed to be um, tied to the, the kind of donkey family. Um, but it is, of course, the same image of our very horse-like uh, uh, zebra that you can see here. Um, I mentioned the, the public had access uh, to the zebra at um, Buckingham House, Buckingham Palace, and there are records of the guards having basically charged people a small fee, um, basically off the books uh, to capitalize on the spectacle and its popularity. Um, that ultimately enters the press and, and uh, is ordered to stop. But the, the, the zebra becomes a great celebrity and it becomes the subject of these, these satirical prints and, and ultimately songs. So this is a, a, a ballad in a sense by Henry Howard from 1762. And I realize it's difficult to see uh, in the object itself. So I pulled out one of the verses, uh, a sight such as this surely never was seen. Who the deuce would not gaze at the ass of a queen? What prospect so charming, what scene can surpass? the delicate sight of Her Majesty's ass. So Henry Howard, the Queen's ass in 1762. Um, and uh, never missing a moment here to, to sort of satirize this uh, extraordinary figure. Um, what I love about it, and actually how I was first introduced to this particular zebra as a subject is through this extraordinary painting by George Stubbs, one of the great animal uh, artists of all time. And I would certainly say, the greatest unquestioned uh, equestrian artist in, in history. Um, this reflects something entirely different. This is obviously uh, an illustration painting here produced from life, uh, and it is so accurate that you can actually identify the subspecies. This is a Cape Mountain uh, zebra, which is the, the smallest of the three main subspecies of zebra. Um, this not entirely sure um, uh, the circumstances by which this came about, but um, it is likely that um, access would have been granted through the, um, maybe the, the workings of William Hunter, the famous Scottish anatomist, who was at, at times physician to Queen Charlotte. 
Uh, Hunter, William Hunter and his brother John were, were celebrated anatomists uh, in, based in London at the end of the 18th century, and they both founded extraordinary collections. Uh, the collection of John Hunter, which is the basis of the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London, uh, features another Stubbs work that I will show you later. This piece remained in Stubbs studio and was ultimately sold after his death and is now at the Yale Center for British Art. So two years after its arrival, or a year or so after its arrival, this painting was produced and it ultimately enters into print in the form of this beautiful mezzotint by Stubbs's son, George Townley Stubbs of 1771. So one of the things that both Jennifer and I are interested in is not only the source of imagery, but the dissemination of imagery, because in this case, you're talking about the first zebra to be brought to England and to be put on public display. Uh, it is through access that people come to, to know about this, this celebrated species, but um, the number of people who would have had access to the real thing versus those that would have experienced it in print uh, would have been uh, considerably smaller. So the, the impact of print uh, on disseminating information, right or wrong, is, uh, is certainly very powerful as a tool at this period as it remains um, until the invention of photography in the 19th century and, and continued beyond. So Jennifer mentioned that in the context of advertising, but you can see uh, the power of print in, in, other, in other forms. Um, the, the zebra, despite its celebrity, had a, a, a bit of a reputation. There were attempts made to tame it, uh, which it seems to have um, resisted. And uh, it was anything but docile. There are numerous accounts of it biting and kicking. Um, so uh, the, the hope and dream that ultimately one day they would be able to hitch the zebra to the queen's carriage never materialized. Um, the same was true. There was actually a second zebra that uh, the Queen acquired. It ended up at the Tower of London because uh, it, it too uh, was, was anything but accommodating. Um, but I include this wonderful image that I've used in, uh, in class with my students in the past. Um, this is much, much later on, uh, 19th century. This is Lord Rothschild, Lionel Walter Rothschild, and his zebra-drawn carriage. Um, Rothschild's collection, great uh, member of the banking family, but he was trained as a zoologist and his personal collection of natural history um, was used to form a private museum, which is now a satellite of the Natural History Museum in London based in the town of Tring. Uh, but rather famously here, Lord Rothschild succeeded where his um, predecessors had failed in hitching up the zebras to his carriage and making quite uh, a spectacle here in, um, at the end of the, uh, the, the 19th century. So um, from a case study of a single exotic animal, I thought we'd explore um, an example of a menagerie. Um, the term, as I mentioned, really refers to um, the, the act of kind of managing exotic animals, um, and it ultimately uh, applies to the, the places or spaces in which those animals are kept. Um, you have examples of um, menageries in royal households and on the estates of, of the great and good in English and, and European society. Um, but in the uh, late 18th and early 19th centuries, you have individuals, sort of showmen or impresarios, who take these, these shows literally out on the road uh, in the form of traveling menageries. They, they travel to town to town. Uh, and it brings the exotic animals of the world to, uh, to the people of, of towns and villages across the country. Um, there were a couple of examples of um, menageries that, that ended up in a single location and became great public attractions. Um, probably the, the best known in Britain was the Royal Menagerie at the Tower of London, but uh, one of its great competitors is what you can see here. This is the Exeter Exchange, what was more commonly known as Exeter Change. Uh, and this is uh, from 1829. This is actually uh, a print produced at the time that the building in the center there, as you can see, it was demolished. Um, and what you're looking at is a, a, a actually a late 17th century building that's been heavily altered. And you can see, just as with Astley's Amphitheater, it's, it's plastered in advertising to promote the show. Um, on the ground floor, it was an open arcade. It was open for business. But on the second and third floors, it housed exotic animals that became a, a great attraction in, uh, in London. Um, supposedly the, uh, the sound produced particularly by the big cats uh, was such that it would often frighten uh, the horses pulling the carriages in the street below. 
Um, as I mentioned, pulled down in 1829, but to give you a sense of where this is, this is on the Strand in London, and it is roughly opposite the current location of the Savoy Hotel. So it's interesting how uh, it's still an entertainment area, just uh, entertainment of a different sort. So uh, the Exeter Exchange housed this extraordinary menagerie from about 1773. It was founded by a man named Thomas Clark, who was a dealer in exotic animals. And it remained under uh, the ownership of, of different uh, proprietors until 1829, when it ultimately closed. Um, this is an illustration of uh, what was referred to as the Royal Menagerie. Uh, it had no real royal connection. It was just to kind of, uh, it's tapping into the, the interest generated by the, uh, the rival menagerie at the Tower of London. Um, this was run at the time by a man named uh, Stefani Polito, who, like his predecessor, a man named Gilbert Pidcock, ran a traveling menagerie. And they used Exeter Exchange, really, as, in a sense, as a kind of winter quarters. It's where they would keep the animals when they were not on tour. Some of them ultimately uh, come to rest here and are on permanent display because of the commercial uh, value and interest in the Exeter Exchange uh, throughout the, the latter part of the 18th and early 19th centuries. There is a little bit of artistic license in this case because uh, the records indicate that the elephant uh, that we'll come back to in a second that you can see straight down the aisle there was actually in a slightly different location uh, in the building as it was at the time. So uh, because of the elephant's significance, it's been um, brought in somewhat liberally into this image that in, is intended to encapsulate the whole. But you can see the sort of great and good of, of British society there at the, the early part of the 19th century, um, admiring the animals on display. Um, just to kind of mimic uh, what Gem Jennifer had done earlier, we've, we have this extraordinary collection at the Ringling of these, these uh, wonderful advertisements. So this is an advertisement for Polito's Royal Menagerie, and you can see in 1815 or thereabouts. Um, what I love about these is, uh, is the language, um, which is uh, extraordinary. Uh, it's sort of a, a, an example of uh, hyperbole to the nth degree, but it also is the typography, the, the, the print that is used um, and the relationship between the print, uh, which really adds a, a level of interest and dynamism to these uh, otherwise very straightforward forms of, of advertisement. Um, to sort of end this section, I wanted to look at two, again, case studies of, of individual animals that were on display. Um, this is another work by uh, the great painter George Stubbs of, of a rhinoceros, male Indian rhinoceros, that uh, Gilbert Pidcock, the second proprietor, is believed to have acquired in about 1790 for roughly 700 pounds, which was an extraordinary sum of money at the time. Um, this and the elephant uh, that I will show you in a second, um, both Indian uh, species brought through the East India Company back, uh, back to London. Um, the rhinoceros uh, was supposedly very docile. Uh, it was uh, willing to be sort of petted or patted on the back. It would occasionally be, be let out and kind of led around by a keeper to show it off. Um, but it, it also developed uh, a taste supposedly for sweet red wine. Um, and there are a number of records of it downing three or four bottles in, in a given sitting. Um, this did not do the rhinoceros any justice, and uh, in roughly 1792 or thereabouts, um, while getting up after apparently one of these um, bouts of drink, it stumbles and dislocates one of its legs. Um, it gets up and continues on and continues to be shown both at the Exeter Exchange and out touring uh, in, in Pidcock's Menagerie. Um, into 1793, when ultimately it dies uh, from complications resulting from uh, inflammation that, that resulted from the injury. Um, but it, that was not before uh, George Stubbs was commissioned by John Hunter, the anatomist that I mentioned to you earlier, uh, to produce this extraordinary painting. Um, John Hunter, famous as a human anatomist, but was also an early pioneer of comparative anatomy, so had an interest in the animal world uh, and his collection, which ended up at the Royal College of Surgeons in London, uh, features natural history as well as examples of human anatomy. Uh, I have seen this painting there, and, and this too is, is how I was first introduced to the subject. Um, 
in, uh, in, in a fashion that Barnum would have appreciated uh, the, the following century, uh, after the, the rhino ultimately passed on, that was of course not the end of the story because Pidcock had the skin stuffed and you could actually see the stuffed rhino again on display at the Exeter Change. Um, the other elephant uh, that, or the other animal, excuse me, that I wanted to highlight is, is the elephant, male Indian elephant, Chuni. Um, and it's unfortunately Chuni's death that is, is best remembered. Uh, this was in, in 1826. Um, this is a large male elephant, uh, Indian elephant, kept in captivity, as you can see here. Um, and this is one of the few elephants in, in Europe at the time uh, about which comparatively little was known. Um, unfortunately, what happens in 1826 is the elephant is in uh, must, basically. Its testosterone levels have, have increased, uh, and it is, um, because it is on its own, it's, it's greatly sexually frustrated, and it is also, no doubt, dealing with, with boredom, uh, being penned up all day long. Um, the, the accounts uh, of, of the events that lead up to its demise are a little bit mixed, but it sounds like it was being let out, sort of aired out on the strand, walked around by a keeper, um, and in an act of aggression, uh, the, the elephant either injures or kills the keeper. Uh, and a couple of days later, the, the situation has not improved. The animal is proving increasingly aggressive. The cause for that, of course, at the time was not entirely understood. So uh, what ends up happening is a group of soldiers are, are uh, brought over from Somerset House nearby um, and they, they shoot the elephant. Um, apparently it was a, a protracted process. It was um, rather excruciating, uh, excruciating agonizing uh, and, and took probably over an hour or so before the, 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 anim, uh, the, the elephant drew its last breath. Um, like with the queen's ass, uh, the elephant uh, attracted great public interest, but also um, uh, was not out of the reach of the great satirists of the age. This is an example of the work of George Cruikshank, who was one of the great illustrators uh, of the late 18th and early 19th century. So this is the destruction of the furious elephant at Exeter Change, or the death of Chuni, the Indian elephant, in 1826. So from exotic animals, I, I thought I would end with um, two extraordinary individuals. Um, and in this case, uh, this is a, another print from the Ringling Collection from 1784. It is the figure in the center that I am uh, most interested in. Uh, this is a, a, an Irishman named Charles Byrne, and he is depicted here with uh, the, the Knight brothers. Um, and it, it's a little hard to tell, um, but they are uh, extraordinary for their size. Um, these were three Irish giants, Byrne being the best known of, of the three. Uh, the Knight brothers were famous as identical twins. Um, Charles Byrne uh, was said at the time to be over eight feet tall, um, but uh, the, the skeleton has, has since been measured and, and it is seven feet, seven inches or thereabouts. Um, but he was extraordinarily tall. Um, he had the condition known as gigantism, which is basically the result of a, a a kind of an overproduction of growth hormone in childhood, uh, and he becomes uh, an attraction. He travels with a, um, an exhibition and ultimately works his way down from Ireland through Scotland into Northern England and ends up in London. Um, and he was exhibited in, uh, tied to fairs or in coffee houses or in theaters, uh, anywhere where they could draw an audience to uh, admire his extraordinary size. Um, Byrne was, was well-liked, but uh, ultimately, um, I think the sort of celebrity uh, got to him. There are various accounts of him uh, uh, resorting to sort of drink, uh, but he dies at a very early age, in his early 20s. Um, during the year or so that he spent in London, he, he was the talk of the town. He, he drew tremendous attention on the part of the public, uh, but he also piqued the interest of John Hunter, the anatomist that I mentioned, Hunter being a great collector. And Hunter, as, as uh, a scientist, was particularly interested uh, in the parts of the human body and, and amassed an extraordinary anatomical collection that included examples of when things go right, and then also what he referred to as, as when things went wrong. So extraordinary cases 
uh, that he, he thought might hold the key to understanding the condition that they represent. Um, so it, Hunter uh, approaches Byrne and actually tries to negotiate with him for his, his corpse. Uh, when the time comes that Byrne ultimately passes on, Hunter is interested in acquiring Byrne's remains for his collection. Uh, Byrne refuses, um, but is unfortunate uh, un in, in not being successful uh, to, in, in having his plans for his burial car carried out. Partly because of the interest that had been piqued in the part of the, what he refers to as the surgical fraternity at the time, um, he, he makes plans for his body to be um, basically encased in a leaden coffin and sunk at sea, to be taken out at sea and, 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 and buried so that no one could get to him. Um, but Hunter had, uh, was a step ahead, and there are again various accounts, but potentially paid the, the undertaker to redirect Burns' corpse, uh, and it did ultimately end up uh, where you have been able to see it for the last uh, century or more in Hunter's Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. Um, I've seen it there a number of times, and you can see, uh, probably pretty obvious in this case, that we're looking at the skeleton on the left, and there is a display here that talks about Byrne and, and his life. In recent years, uh, the story of Charles Byrne, the first of the Irish giants, uh, and his demise, and ultimately uh, Hunter's act in, in acquiring uh, Byrne's skeleton and putting it on display, has drawn uh, a great deal of, um, or it sort of has stirred up controversy, and it, it's drawn a great deal of, of negative opinion. The Hunterian is currently closed for renovations, and uh, the uh, sort of governing body of the Royal College of Surgeons is considering the possibility of taking the skeleton off display and also the possibility of having uh, the body uh, in, interned, to, to have it uh, properly buried uh, and no longer the subject of, of public interest. So uh, the popularity and success, in a sense, commercially of Charles Byrne, or I should say the notoriety of Byrne, inspires later Irish giants. Um, this is probably the best known example of, of Byrne's successor. This is a man named Patrick Cotter, uh, who took on the name, as did Cotter's successors, of O'Brien. So there are a string of Irish giants that bear that name. Um, partly the choice there is, is that it tied uh, in a kind of mythology built up around the figure to a line of, of great Irish kings. Um, Patrick Cotter did live into his 40s, um, so he, he li lived nearly twice as long as did Byrne, um, but as a result of Byrne's experience, um, he, he benefits uh, in that he's able to kind of capitalize on the notoriety of the Irish giant. Um, he's first exhibited by a showman, but then later sort of takes um, control of his own destiny and, and benefits from, from his own uh, interactions with the public. But uh, he also goes to great lengths to ensure that his body is buried uh, successfully uh, after, after death. So in this case, uh, he laid out very detailed plans for how his um, uh, coffin was to be basically strapped in iron and then sunk in solid rock to a depth of about 12 feet. Um, he was successful uh, in that, um, and at least initially, and in that his body was not exhumed and he was not in death, uh, again, made the subject of display. Um, but the body has been exhumed three times since his death in, in the 1820s. Uh, the third time was because of, uh, of uh, renovations to the church where the body was buried. Uh, and at that point, there was a ceremony and the body was cremated. Um, but there are articles of clothing and other things that still survive that relate to Cotter who was a great uh, curiosity and public attraction at the uh, end of the 18th and into the early 19th centuries. And uh, Cotter uh, is one of those uh, exhumations. They were able to actually measure the skeleton. And he indeed was over eight feet tall and is the first human being recorded at that height um, and held that record for the better part of a century. Eight feet um, in advertising terms was always the height that was, was communicated. Um, a string of these individuals were eight feet or higher, but in reality, Cotter is the first that, that has been measured and verified at, at eight feet in height. Uh, so two rather extraordinary individuals. 
Uh, this is an, an advertisement promoting Cotter or O'Brien around 1800, again, from the Ringling's collections. So you can see here, eight feet, four inches, even that is slightly off. Um, but presumably, uh, unlike the image there, where it, it does indeed look like he's being measured, um, they uh, uh, were, were smart enough to nev never have it uh, actually verified. So they could uh, round it off in a way that was advantageous to them. So that really bring, brings us to the end. And uh, as we come sort of full circle, uh, we thought we would um, return to this image where we began to look at the various parts of, of the, the circus as it was in its heyday. You have the, the sideshow banner where um, Cotter or uh, Burns successors would have, would have uh, been presented to the public uh, here in the 1920s, you would have had the menagerie uh, where uh, later zebras and rhinos and elephants uh, would, be, would be shown and, and uh, sort of excite the wonder of the general public. And then beyond the, uh, the performance tent where one would see uh, the successors to Mary Andrews and uh, the, the wire walkers that Jennifer showed earlier. Uh, and with that, that sort of brings us back to Astley here and, and the origins of the modern circus as represented in, in prints in our collection. Jennifer, are you free to, or, or happy to open things up to? Uh, absolutely, we're happy to answer questions. Um, I, I will say Ingrid gave us a comment about a couple of things, but the, the Andre the Giant's interesting because I think it was just yesterday, I, reading through some news feed, there was an article about Andre the Giant um, and what a, what a unique character he was. And I think that, that fascination with bodies of difference is is something that, that we see throughout time and it's something I think many of you have heard us talk about this in regards to the Ringling collections. We have avoided these topics, one because it is largely sideshow and therefore we haven't thought about it in the context of circus, but more than that, um, it, it's it's a difficult topic to talk about with great sensitivity, and it's something that I think the print collection we have and bringing the sideshow banner lines forward in the historic galleries is going to give us time to start to talk about displays of people because of difference and explore that in a way that situates it historically and gives us gives us a good platform to talk about how we treat people today. So I, and I'm really looking forward to that element of opening up our collections. The animal displays as well. I think we see that image of the killing of the elephant uh, at the exchange and it's, it's very troubling. Although I would argue the fact that that print exists speaks of how troubling it was in that moment as well. There's, there's um, an ambivalence in that image of, of people who are shooting at this animal that is clearly dangerous. And then the men that are standing back, whether it's in fear or in uncertainty. Um, and so being able to explore those topics, I think is an important role for the museum. Yeah, and it is really the, um, the death of Chuni that is the beginning of the end for the Exeter Exchange as it was on the Strand. Uh, the animals that survived in, in 1828, 1829 were relocated by the, the fourth owner, a man named uh, Edward Cross, and they were taken to um, his newly established Surrey Zoological Gardens, which was in Boxall in South London. Um, that also intended as a rival to the recently established London Zoo in Regent's Park, which is really the first modern zoological garden. Uh, Jennifer, on the point that you were just making, would you mention briefly uh, as you and I and, and Laura are all here about the Variabilities Conference, uh, which we hope to reschedule for next year. I will, in fact, it's, it was, I just changed my calendar date. So we have been working collaboratively with a colleague at New College, uh, Dr. Miriam Wallace, who is also in touch with colleagues in the UK to sponsor a, an academic conference that is now, this would be its fifth or sixth iteration. And the title of the conference is Very Abilities, with a capital A there in the middle. And it comes out of disability studies to look at the, the variety of the human body experience. Uh, so we had everything in place to have a wonderful slate of speakers this coming June presenting on topics, some of which touched on circus and the allied arts, but others were, were about the experience of variable bodies across cultural and social uh, norms. So 
that conference, obviously, we are not able to hold at the moment, but we are in the process of rescheduling it one year out. So next summer, we will be hosting that. Uh, and it, it came, it, it honestly probably is what kicked off the, the interest that we had in this particular mm -hmm. program that we've given today. Dr. Wallace is a specialist in 18th century British literature, and she had come to the archives to look into some of these figures like the giants that David spoke about and also people of small stature who were being displayed in fairs and in pubs and then were written about in literature. So she came to do that research and we started talking about the need to open up how we interpret our collections and, and to, to bring in scholars whose experience isn't strictly circus oriented to, to add their knowledge. And I mean, I very much talking with David and with Miriam, that's helped me understand my collections, the things I work with better. And so the variabilities is gonna be a wonderful opportunity to listen to people who are grappling with these issues in, in very meaningful ways. And I ask that one of the things we do during that experience is to have a session in front of our sideshow banner line images, because I think it's an opportunity for us to learn with better sensitivity how to interpret those wagons, the images on them, both in a historical moment in the mid 20th century and in light of the experiences of people who have been displayed or have displayed themselves because of their physical difference. Any other questions or comments? Oh, I think always, we did cover it all. Yes. I was just going to say it's always difficult to make a critique of what went on in prior periods because uh, the culture was so different and people's understanding of these things, um, their humanity for those who, in essence, were born with these differences and had a difficulty making a living often in any other way besides allowing themselves to be exhibited. Exactly, and that's, to me, that's really one of the critical roles of the museum is to be a place for that dialogue. It's not a place to, to judge, it's a place to give information and explain. And actually, I think the prints that we've been discussing today are, are part of that kind of experience as well. When you, as well, when you look at the time period, they are kind of summing up the, the age of enlightenment, right? As, as people have become more interested in learning about the outside world, and as print itself is allowed a dissemination of, of information and imagery, collecting these prints was a chance, certainly some people collected them to gawk at whatever the image was, but I think as much it was a chance to learn something about the world. Um, and, and so we see that in print, and I've always had the premise that that is part, a very important part of what the circus in its modern form has always done, to, to give a, a venue, a, an outlet to share information and experiences. And the museum does that as well. Right. And that's one of the, the beauties of the Ringling's collection, but it's also part of the responsibility of an institution like the Ringling. Um, is to to look at the, the the many sides of these complex issues that um, it is easy to dismiss some of this stuff looking back on it historically um, but yet the the issues both at the time and even today are very complex and um, they, they are worth exploring in greater detail and um, it's talks like this and other programs that we've we've mentioned um, that that are really wonderful in in bringing people into conversation uh, and I think there's also an interest, Jennifer and I were just talking yesterday about inviting other scholars to come and, and, and offer their perspective, coming from totally different fields of knowledge, um, but yet whose, whose subjects of interest um, kind of skirt around the edges of this and, and connect in really interesting ways. And, and it, um, it, it opens up all, a whole range of new opportunities for exploration, which is very exciting. Yeah, it's, it's one of the joys of working at The Ringling for me is having colleagues like David who, who have a background and knowledge that they don't necessarily immediately associate with circus. And then when I start talking to them, I learn a tremendous amount that informs my work because their knowledge does interlap and o overlap with the things that I'm looking at and thinking about. Well, we're happy to answer any more questions if you have them. Yeah, I'll defer question. to Jennifer because she's the expert. Yeah. Yes. 
Jenny Lee. Hi. Um, the slide that you had put up of the famous Dutch woman and I took a screenshot um, and celebrated Miss Wilkinson, where it's the same garments, they just changed a couple of things. Yes. Uh, I have to double check my fashion history, uh, but off the top of my head, what's really interesting about this is that the fashions that they changed to for Miss Wilkinson, um, although the shoes are time period correct for the late 1700s, um, her use of a ruff went out of style in, I think it's the mid 1600s, I have to triple check that. Um, and her hairstyle, and headpiece is interesting as well because it doesn't appear to be totally on track with the hairstyle of the time. So this is a really interesting image to me as um, I study uh, circus costume history as part of my PhD studies um, and I have a background in some fashion history. So what's, what's interesting to me about this image is that we're seeing a reflection of not only taking costume from a hundred years ago but adding other layers of kind of hearkening back to other historical time periods. So this is really cool. <laughs> that is really fascinating. Um, and I'm so glad you were here and able to comment on that. Uh, Jenny Lee feels like a plant for me these days because she is one of those scholars. Oh no, in the best way, um, because she is one of those scholars who's doing work that is now overlapping into circus in these wonderful, rich ways. And so I get to learn from them. Um, and the interesting thing with that is I know that the Miss Wilkinson date is more or less correct because the Wilkinson sisters who performed at Sadler's Wells were friends with the father of Joseph Grimaldi, the, the originator of the clown as we conceive of it. Um, there's, there's mentions of relationships between them. So, so I'm pretty confident on the date on that one. The other ones are the ones that I'm still trying to kind of pin down. So that's fascinating. These are images I meant to share with you anyway, following our last discussion. So, um, so you can see these are opportunities again as we share out into the world to, to learn more about our collections and, and then through information like that to be able to consider why were performers doing that? What and why why were the printers, you know, who what kind of choices were being made to to make that image anachronistic in that way? It's fascinating. So and Jennifer and I have talked before that the same is is true with the animal images that are used. Um, the, the printers are quite um, loose with the sources that they're drawing from. Uh, they pull from uh, sources of natural history. They're, they're pulling from um, things like the London Magazine that we saw, so sort of popular um, uh, magazines and other, and other uh, publications of the, the era. And basically anywhere you could find a lion or a tiger uh, that, that you thought was vaguely accurate uh, could be repurposed. Uh, particularly for the purposes of advertising. And, and it's wonderful to kind of track some of these because they do like with the shoes or the, um, you know, the costume of the, of the wire walker, uh, they are tweaked a little bit, but the, but the essence of it is still the same. And, and those images perpetuate for hundreds of years in some instances, even the, you know, inaccuracies included. Um, so it's, it's fascinating to think that, um, you know, that is the principal way that many people uh, gained exposure to some of the uh, the animals of the world in absence of the real thing. Well, I think if that's it, we, we've overdone our hour just a tiny bit, um, but I'm really grateful to you all for joining us. It's, Thank it's Thank been fun to get to talk about this part that we're enjoying so much, and you all know how to reach out to us one way or another if any questions come up. So thank you so much, and have a good afternoon. Yes. Well, thank you, Jennifer. Well, thank thank you. you, David. Thank you. Thank you. See you next time. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.